Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Michael Klein, who's a pathologist in chief emeritus for the Hospital of Special Hospital for Special Surgery and Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Weill Cornell School of Medicine. He did his medical training at Temple University, pathology training, uh, um, internship and residency at NYU, and fellowship training at both NYU and Columbia University. Um, he's uh, um, been faculty at the Hospital for Joint Diseases Orthopedic Institute, um, as well as Mount Sinai and uh, University of Alabama and uh, pathologist in chief at Hospital for Special Surgery since 2008. Um, uh, in the 16 years he was at Mount Sinai, he was uh, awarded uh, uh, best teacher by the students uh, in nine years. Um, and that's pretty incredible. Uh, his major area of service has always been surgical pathology, but his specific expertise is orthopedic pathology. He uh, authored his first description and clinical analysis of renal oncocytoma in 1976, but was also uh, author and editor-in-chief of the first non-neoplastic diseases of bone and joint atlas of the AFIP, when it was called AFIP. Um, He's been a member of the ISS for 34 years, has chaired its members meeting committee and has been awarded its Corinne Farrell prize, its founders medal and has delivered its annual founders lecture. Um, Michael says he's probably best known for his lectures dealing with patho-radiographic correlation, which is a particular interest. He's also a successful biologic a uh, biological photographer freelancing for Getty Images, and six of his photographs are in the Smithsonian Institution. Um, he claims that he's a passable watercolor hobbyist, but I've seen some of his paintings and he's, uh, I'd like to be passable. So uh, with that, Dr. Klein, go ahead, give us a fabulous lecture. Thanks, Hillary. Appreciate it. Uh, after that introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, to give this talk sort of in the reverse way that I give most of the talks, which is radiology first, pathology second. I'm going to mix it up and uh, and sometimes show you pathology and then go backward. Hopefully, it'll all work. Um, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't put up this picture because my institution requires me to tell you that unfortunately I have no conflicts of interest, which means I'm, I don't have that much money in the bank, but um, I'm still alive and there's still hope. Anyway, I don't have any conflicts of interest um, and I'll, go, I'll get right into what I'm gonna say. Okay, so I was a general pathologist before I was a bone pathologist, but things in bone pathology are, are true in the same way that they are in general pathology. If you, if you lump it all up, there are a limited number of diseases that exist out there. Those diseases exist in bone as well as in uh, other tissues. Um, I want you to focus on this list in the, uh, in the uh, third and fourth entities down, traumatic and neoplastic. The reason I want you to focus on those is because Trauma, in, in my mind, is about the most common disease of bone and neoplastic diseases, that is primary bone tumors are about the rarest uh, in, this, uh, in this list. Uh, and just to show you how rare they are, um, if I put both of those uh, entities into a font proportional to the way they occur in nature, uh, this is how neoplastic would look next to traumatic provided you multiplied the font of neoplastic times 100. In other words, you couldn't see neoplastic if you could see traumatic that large. Um, another way of saying this is to just sort of roughly plot these on a relative incidence scale. Um, and basically, there are, there are two trauma peaks, one in young individuals that are active and one in old individuals that fall down a lot. Um, 
there are two neoplastic peaks, one in uh, young individuals who get primary bone tumors and another in elderly individuals that uh, get metastatic bone tumors. And basically to, to put these on the same axis, you have to logarithmically uh, take care of neoplastic. That is, you have to multiply the incidence of, of, uh, of these by four times 10 to the third to get them on the same graph. So bone tumors are fairly rare, okay? Now, as a pathologist, you know, you, you can see something like a pathologic fracture, like what you see on the left of this picture, right? So this is an articular end of bone that's undergone a fracture. I think it's from a humerus. You see articular cartilage here. You see subarticular bone here. You see lots and lots of hemorrhage where the fracture line is. And when you look at this at higher power, you can see that the probable reason for that fracture is the fact that there's metastatic carcinoma here, okay? So you can see the whole thing on a section. You can see what you need to see on a section. That's interesting, okay? Um, it's not generally what we see as pathologists nowadays. What we generally see as pathologists nowadays is that most bone lesions have sort of migrated to ever smaller and smaller biopsies and we get things that look like this, okay? So this is actually a core biopsy. It, it, it was done by a radiologist. It comes from a lesion that was clinically sclerotic. So what you see here are, are thickened trabeculae. Some of them you can still see a lamellar pattern, even though this is not polarized. You can see lots and lots of these purple things that are smooth, and those are uh, arrest cement lines. And there are many more of them than you would expect in cancellous bone. So this is consistent with a sclerotic lesion, great. And so this is at or near a lesion that was clinically known to be sclerotic. But the problem is that all of the uh, intertrabecular spaces are replaced by purple stuff that you can't tell anything about at all. Uh, that may be due to heat, that may be due to compression. I'm not sure why it's there, but the problem is I don't see anything else that's lesional here except for sclerosis. And that doesn't necessarily impart very much information to whoever got the biopsy. Um, and uh, sort of the problem with smaller and smaller biopsies is that you get less and less tissue, you get more and more artifact, okay? Now, you are probably not familiar with the way that we do surgical pathology. So I'm gonna to try to explain that to you in, in two or three different sets of, of analogies, okay? Um, now, when a radiologist sees um, conventional radiographs or CT scans or so on, basically you have a, a picture of a whole region uh, and, and one study like the complementary study builds on what the uh, original uh, um, slide showed. Uh, the idea being that uh, the CT or the MR or whatever you do uh, answers questions that maybe the, uh, the uh, conventional radiography didn't, uh, didn't answer, but, but perhaps posed. Um, pathology isn't exactly like the same kind of ant mini that you see in, in radiology. With pathology, you know, you get a sampling of a lesion that generally you haven't seen because lots and lots of times there, there hasn't necessarily been any clinical studies. So you're reliant upon whoever did the biopsy to uh, let you know where it came from. And then you think about that anatomic site. You think about the alphabet of that site because you learned that in histology. And then you have to sort of put the little pieces into what you think is that alphabet. And so you get those little pieces. These little pieces represent uh, a biopsy, just like I showed you previously. And um, you have to determine what alphabet it came from, right? Just from the pieces. You have to determine whether it's Cyrillic or whether it's English or whatever. And then you have to think about that alphabet and think of the context of that alphabet to know whether or not there's something wrong with the letters or the way the letters are put together. All of that from the small little pieces. And it's very hard to do that if you don't have context. And surgical pathology doesn't often have a lot of context. And I tell that to my colleagues doing surgical pathology that it might not be a bad idea to look at clinical images if they're available on their particular um, um, electronic uh, uh, data retrieval, because they will tell you a lot more than necessarily just some crumbs will, and they'll put things in context for you, okay?
So here's the second half of that. Um, this is context, okay? It's a 273 or 274 uh, piece uh, jigsaw puzzle, which my daughter made for me. Uh, and obviously the person up on the rock is myself. Those are my two grandchildren. This is the day before the great American eclipse in uh, August of uh, 2017. And we're sitting on a rock in, uh, in um, Grand Teton National Park, okay? That's the context. If you have a conventional radiograph or if you have a, a, a CT um, uh, scout image and a bunch of uh, cross cuts, this is what you guys will see. Okay, what the pathologist sees is this, okay, if it's been curated. Or if you ignore that and look at the one on the bottom, this is what a core biopsy is supposed to look like. Now, I dare you to look at that or that and tell me where this came from if you didn't have contact. If you're going to do a, a, a jigsaw puzzle, it's always nice to have a master puzzle so that you can see where the various colors belong. But in pathology, you, you don't get more than this, okay? And with this, you're expected to make a cogent diagnosis, which in bone is completely ridiculous, okay? Um, it's ridiculous because you don't have the context. And a lot of pathologists out there don't, uh, don't think about how much you need the context. Now, what does the context do for me, okay? When I have a, uh, when I have a, uh, a, uh, a curetting, you know, I might say, well, there's a lot of material there. I don't know how to put it together, so give me more. And surgeon might comply with that. But, but again, you have all these pieces. You don't know where they go, okay? What conventional radiographs do for me is give me the border. It gives me the framework in which to put other pieces. So when I start looking at pieces that aren't straight edge, I go, okay, I can fit those into there. And I get the idea that there are legs here, there are shorts here, maybe there's a shirt here. And I get a little bit more context. If I'm really, really experienced and I've really seen a lot of the particular kind of lesion before, I might suggest a diagnosis of, of just that with, 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 uh, with just this many pieces here. Otherwise, I need to put more pieces uh, into context. I need to do, uh, I need to do maybe some uh, special stains. Uh, I need to do immunohistochemistry and the pieces start to come together. And eventually, if I can't do it with all of that, I still have molecular sometimes as a, as a background and I sort of get what is going on there and I can sort of make a diagnosis, okay? But I can do all of those things and, and without the, the context of the, of the border, I, I am just completely lost, okay? All of my uh, expertise over the years doesn't mean anything if I don't have enough of that information. And when pathologists send me outside consultations, often they will send me slides and maybe they'll tell me what the radiographs were supposed to have looked like, but they won't give me any more. And I'll, I'll call them back and say, listen, I can give you a consultation, but if you want an expert consultation, I need the information that I would use as an expert, okay? Um, another way to say this, okay? Um, this is a high power of a, of a cytology or a surgical pathology specimen, uh, except it isn't, obviously, it's just yellow flowers. Um, if I told you that the name of these flowers is called rock madwort, and you're a botanist, you might know that these flowers like to grow in Mediterranean climates on rocky hillsides, hence the name rock madwort. But I don't think you can tell me, given the information in this picture, where I was when I took this picture. You have to back up. You have to realize that we're not in the woods here. There's an old reinforced concrete block building with a broken railing here and some safety signs. And it's not until you walk a couple of hundred yards away to the shore, get on a boat, sail away from this about a kilometer, turn around and you can see that here's the rock madwort. Here's some more rock madwort, but this is the one I was taking a picture of with the building in the background. And you could not have told me that my picture was Alcatraz, okay? Unless I put it in context. In other words, while those flowers are certainly represented in the picture, they're not representative of the picture as a whole. And to me, that's the importance of clinical imaging. It puts very small tissue biopsies into context. Now, of course, there are other things that come into play when making a pathologic diagnosis. 
Some of those are um, your uh, training background, um, your personal prejudices, what you ate for breakfast this morning, whether you had an argument or made up with a partner and so on. All of those things come into account when you make a diagnosis. And ba basically that's what I'm trying to say in this picture, which the Italian translates into Italy is seen in the eyes of a Sicilian. You know, everything is sort of relative, okay? Now, since bone lesions are externally essentially invisible when they come in, without any imaging, you can't localize the process as a pathologist. You can't characterize the process. You can't assess the relationship of the process to the bone. You can't determine the adequacy of the biopsy. And you can do all of those things if you have the right images with a small biopsy, okay? This is 2021. Clinicians and patients want minimal invasiveness. They want decreased morbidity. They want rapid turnover times. They want accurate diagnoses. And in fact, they want safety from viruses, I guess, since it's 2021. I can't give them the last one. Um, and I can't give them a lot of the other things, but I can help things along if I have enough information, okay? So open biopsies that we saw in the 60s and 70s and 80s gave way to needle biopsies. Needle biopsies have even given way to fine needle aspiration, which can work for bone lesions, but I wouldn't want to make a habit of it. The smaller the amount of tissue sampled, the longer and the more carefully you have to examine it up to a point because there's a limit of what you can see in something with just what's in the lesion alone, okay? So the need for imaging studies, I believe, is inversely proportional to the size of the biopsy. Smaller the biopsy, the more information you need to put it in context, okay? Here's a, a good example of that. This is a fine needle aspiration, okay? And I show you this field because in this fine needle aspiration, there were only eight and a half nuclei. I've counted them, that's how many there are here. Eight and a half nuclei in the entire glass slide, okay? Everything else was blood. Um, this FNA was done by the person I consider the best FNA pathologist in the United States, or at least was at the time this was done. And he correctly identified that these eight and a half nuclei belong to malignant cells, okay? This was a 47-year-old man who had pain in his right upper arm. And what this pathologist asked me was, do you think this is an osteosarcoma? I've already determined that this is a, a, a spindle cell lesion with malignant cells, so I think it's a malignant tumor. And most likely, I think this is an osteosarcoma. What do you think? Now, I have to always go back to Henry Jaffe. Henry Jaffe wrote this wonderful book in 1958, uh, Tumors and Tumor-like Conditions of, of Bones and Joints. And to distill that book into two sentences or two bullet points, basically the first one is that specific lesions of bone occur in reproducible clinical settings. And secondly, very importantly, you make the correct diagnosis with the greatest frequency when the clinical parameters and the imaging findings are correlated with the histologic features, okay? Now, what do I get about this case that, that fits into this framework, okay? The first thing is this patient is 47 years old. The fifth decade is statistically the least likely age in which you're going to develop an osteosarcoma, unless of course you, you happen to have had um, a therapeutic radiation to that area, which this patient has not. The second thing is that the imaging findings have not been correlated with the histologic features. And I called this pathologist and I said, well, you know, have you seen the clinical radiographs? He says, no, I haven't. And I thought to myself, well, how did you even figure out where to stick the needle to aspirate? But I didn't tell him that. And I said, would you be so kind as to figure out what the imaging findings look like and maybe send me a sample? And he said, okay. And a couple of days later, I got one panel of one view of this patient's upper arm and I had a eureka moment, okay? And of course, you would have the eureka moment, I think, as radiologist. You see a lesion that looks like it probably was expansile before it fractured. 
You're not exactly sure where this ends because you don't know whether this is matrix two, but it has relatively lucent areas, relatively dense areas. It has expansion, it has scalloping, it has a bit of cortical thickening, maybe that here. Um, and in addition to that, it has areas of clearing or lucency. It has areas of density. And within those areas of density, there are flecks, there are incomplete arcs and rings. Um, and so to me, this is not a bad x-ray for a, uh, sorry, radiograph for a chondrosarcoma. And because of all the lucency and the fracture and the clearing, it's not a bad x-ray for a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma. And when I think back to what the FNA looked like, basically just high-grade spindle cells, that's not a component of normal chondrosarcoma. And so I said to him, you know, I think this is a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma. And I wrote what I thought was a sufficiently um, protective report for myself that said that I thought this was a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma, but of course it was a, a very small sample, blah, 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 blah. None of that mattered. None of that mattered because this pathologist was in a hospital which was affiliated with Mount Sinai where I was. And within a day or so, that patient was referred there uh, had an operation, a Tikoff Lindbergh by Dempsey Springfield, who basically acted, you know, just on the FNA report consultation that I wrote. And you can see here that uh, you know, very good uh, gross radiographic correlation. The expansile part is hemorrhagic, doesn't look cartilaginous. You can see that there's buttress um, uh, periosteal reaction. You have matrix here, you have matrix here, and the matrix actually looks like cartilage and here you see that it's, it's uh, uh, ossified uh, and the, the FNA was somewhere in this region. This is a very good uh, gross example of, of uh, what would correspond to a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma and the sections bear that out. So on the left, you have the area which undoubtedly was sampled in the FNA and on the right, you have the cartilage matrix which wasn't sampled in the FNA, which would be required if you were going to say that maybe this was a cartilage tumor and it's cellular enough to be malignant. So this is a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma, but I have to say that without that radiograph, this would be literally impossible to, uh, to diagnose or suggest, okay? Now, when trying to diagnose histologic finding in a bone biopsy, a pathologist has three choices, okay? Choice number one um, is what I call the samurai pathology option. That is, you write the report based on what you see in the section, without knowing what was sampled, why it was sampled, or even if it was sampled. This mm -hmm. uh, works basically for metastatic carcinoma with a pathologic fracture. It doesn't work for a whole lot of other things. Just about everything else you would have to uh, put in some kind of context, okay? And very often you don't get, at least in the institutions where I work, you don't necessarily get a fine needle aspiration from metastatic carcinoma, although sometimes you do. Okay, um, the, the upshot of that choice is um, you end up getting sued a lot if you see a lot of biopsies and you're going to uh, diagnose them that way. The second choice is to read the radiologist report and make all of your inferences in pathology based on all your previous histologic experience plus what the radiologist says. Now, that's sort of like a game of do you trust me? You know. You stand there with your eyes closed, your arms out, and you fall down backwards, assuming someone is going to catch you. And you hope that the radiologist's report was specific enough and that the radiologist had enough experience to actually make a cogent diagnosis, which makes total sense when you look at the histology. I'll show you the consequences or the potential consequences of that next. Finally, you can examine the images before or after you look at the slides. Um, and uh, you can do that with or without a radiologist. Um, my suggestion to pathologists, particularly in community hospitals, is it's nice to have a good relationship and communication with at least one radiologist that might have enough time to go over an image with you. Pathologists don't like to do that in the outside world because it takes time away from their practice. And radiologists sometimes don't like to do it because it takes time away from their practice but of course that results in the best kind of diagnosis. Now, let's, let's look at uh, choice number two and let's look at these two um, profile images, shadow drawings, if you will. 
you can see only the outside of these two individuals. Um, you can't see who they are, but the radiologist who's looking behind the screen can see who the, the individuals are. We'll call these individuals number one and number two, and what the radiologist says about individual number one is that. I'll let you read all of these characteristics. I won't read them to you. What the radiologist says about, radio, uh, about uh, uh, individual two is that, okay? Sort of a parallel, okay? Read these choices and decide something, okay? Don't decide who these individuals are. Decide who you would rather associate with, who you would rather trust, who you would rather be your colleague, who you would rather be your boss, your city council member, your mayor, your senator, your governor, your president. Um, and after you've made that decision, um, take a look at the actual individuals and realize that while the radiologist description were totally accurate, they weren't necessarily complete, okay? Um, and, and to judge whether something is complete or not, you really need the whole picture. And it really helps when you see what's going on uh, in the imaging and when you compare that to what's going on in the histology. Okay, um, that's enough of all my analogies. Let's just briefly go back and remember that X-rays are fairly high energy electromagnetic radiation and electromagnetic radiation is, um, it propagates in uh, three dimensions as waves. There's an electrical component. There's a magnetic component that's perpendicular to the electrical component. And we know obviously from, uh, from all the various devices we use that, uh, that we have all kinds of electromagnetic waves. Uh, they all travel at the so-called speed of light, uh, 2.9 times 10 to the eighth meters per second or a, a 186,324 miles per second, if you, if you like the, uh, the uh, English system. And the other thing is that visual light, which, which basically is electromagnetic uh, radiation going from uh, about 380 to 720 or 730 nanometers, is the only kind of electromagnetic radiation to which human beings have receptors. So our rods and cones are able to detect the electrical components of visual light, that's why we can see. But beyond that and below that, we can't detect anything. We can feel heat, we can get sunburned, we can get deeper burns from uh, x-rays because the further to the left you go on this uh, spectrum, the higher the frequency and the higher the frequency, the more of the energy. And in fact, the very, sh the very small wavelengths plus the very high energy of, of x radiation is what allows them to, to penetrate matter, okay? And uh, x-rays are very good at term, in terms of penetrating matter. And x-rays basically see matter for what it is. Uh, what matter is basically is space, okay? It isn't particulate stuff, it's space. If I ask a group of orthopedic surgeons, what is it about, uh, about uh, calcium, for instance, or bone that attenuates x-rays, they're going to tell me it's it's due to the uh, it's due to the nuclei, okay? Because they think about increasing size of nuclei, and they keep a, they keep thinking about in, uh, increasing attenuation. But the problem, of course, is that a nucleus is one billionth of the volume of an atom, and most of the space of an atom is taken up by electron orbitals. And so, the larger the number of electrons, and the larger the number of orbitals you have, and the larger that the, the individual atoms are compressed together. Um, the greater the attenuation of x-rays. And, and even though noble gases like krypton have fairly large atoms and lots and lots of electrons, because the atoms are, are spaced like a gas, you don't get significant attenuation of x-rays when you uh, x-ray a noble gas, okay? So, so basically x-rays see matter for what it is, space, okay? If you were able to take this, all the space out of atoms and just compress all the particles together, for one example, you could take 5,000 aircraft carriers along with all of their um, planes, all of their crews, all of their ordnance and fuel and food and whatever else is hiding on those aircraft carriers. And you could compress all of those uh, particles into a sphere the size of a baseball or a little less, 
And that sphere would have all of the mass of those aircraft carriers without occupying all the space. If you, if you dropped it on solid granite, it would make a bigger splash than if you dropped a heavy rock into water because of the density of that. And it would sink all the way to the center of the earth after oscillating back and forth and back and forth um, between sides of the earth because there's nothing that could contain something like that, okay? So x-rays see things for what they actually are. And of course, by, by, uh, by, by that knowledge, you can look at these two radiographs and you can tell that the woman that has the end chondroma of the pinky also has the real diamond in the engagement ring. While the woman on the right with the cubic zirconia engagement ring uh, has a fake stone. And you can tell that, of course, because you know that carbon is element number six and it has only six electrons and two orbitals and therefore um, is radiolucent, more radiolucent than most of the other things in here. Uh, whereas the woman with the cubic zirconia, zirconium is element number 40, right? So zirconium has 40 electrons and five orbitals and is quite radio dense, okay? Uh, not suggesting that if you wanna look at your engagement ring and tell whether it's real or not, you should do that, but you can do that, okay? Here, obviously, you see this child has, has been eating uh, heavy metals, okay? And you have these lead lines here. There are three lead lines in each of the major bones. Uh, they're more dense as you get toward the growth plate. They're less dense as you get further away. This reflects the fact that osteoclastic activity has come back and has chewed away a lot of the calcified uh, cartilage cores that were left in the bone when that episode happened, a little bit less when this episode happened, and certainly a lot less when the more recent one happened. It also tells you that um, these, uh, these uh, lead lines, which are about the same distance apart in the tibia and fibula, are, are different in the femurs and, and uh, let you know that growth is, is faster in the distal femur than it is in the proximal tibia and fibula. So they're, they're, these are chock full of information. Now, how does pathology explain the imaging features? Uh, we're going to look at how normal anatomy accounts for radiographic appearances and how the biological potential of lesions account for the relationship to surrounding bone on images. We're going to look at some length as how the uh, periosteal reactions are created. And finally, how the content of extracellular matrix accounts for imaging patterns, okay? Uh, if we make a section through the proximal part of the mid-shaft of the femur and make a cross-section of that, we see that the bone follows the law of mass conservation. And that is, you have lots of bone where the bone is needed. You don't have any bone where the bone isn't needed. This is why long bones are hollow, because they want to be as light as they can while being as strong as they can. And there really isn't any force exerted in, inside here at all. That's a good thing, because we need our marrow compartments to make marrow. On the other hand, if you look at the distal part of the femur, you're going to see that the uh, thick cortex tapers down into basically paper thin uh, surface of the bone. And um, inside the bone, you see uh, lots and lots of cancellous bone because in this part of the bone, the bone has to be uh, both resistant to weight and transferring the force efficiently across the joint. It's not all at the surface anymore. So these are basically the two areas of, of, of uh, bone you're going to consider when you look at radiographs. Um, when you actually make a, a, a radiograph, you make a, a two-dimensional construct of a three-dimensional object. You know, the, the radiologist knows everything that's happening here by looking at this. Pathologist doesn't know that. Pathologist looks at this two-dimensional thing and goes, okay, this is cortex and this is cortex and this is medullary cavity. Um, that's not true, okay? It, it is cortex, but it's cortex plus medullary cavity. But the, the path that the, that's transversed by the X-ray photon beam is two thicknesses of cortex here, whereas the path tra traversed by here is more than two thicknesses of cortex. So, um, so basically, you see what you think is cortex here, it is. You see what you think is cortex here, but if you're a pathologist, you don't think about the fact that most of the image here is generated by these news. And the um, uh, internal portion of this is not generally visible if the cortices are intact, okay? 
Now, this equation explains why, why what you see in a, a given clinical radiograph. Um, it's a four-dimensional integral. Uh, it goes from time zero, the time a lesion started or just before the lesion started, to time t, which is now when you do the uh, radiograph. And basically, this is uh, the, the image as it started at, at this time, um, plus the integral of all of the points in which there is a production of bone times the differential production of bone minus resorption of bone times the differential reduction of bone. And what this tells you basically is that there are no absolutes in bone radiology or bone pathology. Uh, what you see is a reflection of what's happening at all the points together at the same time. And while certain things look statistically like, um, like uh, things that you know, there are, there are certain radiological constructs where um, something that looks like what you think it ought to look like is actually something else, which is really the reason why we do biopsies in the first place. The, the second thing I want to tell you, you know all this, obviously, is that at least 40% of the bone along a single path of the x-ray beam has to be destroyed or altered for that destruction to be observed in a single view on conventional radiographs. It's the very good reason why we do more than one view. Orthogonal views are important. Uh, my friend Michael Pitt always used to tell me that one view is no view. And I, I think that um, these views will tell you that, okay? So here you see the edge of a lucent lesion which if you covered this area up, you might not see or perceive at all. You don't see that in the lateral view. And it isn't until you look at the CT scan of this that you realize there's a significant lesion in the distal part of this bone. But the problem is most of the view is covered up by uh, patella, except in the inferior most part of this. And if you take the ratio of this length to this length, in the area where there isn't any patella, you find that the ratio of that is about 40%, which accounts for why you see this in the frontal view and you don't see it in the lateral view at all. On the other hand, if you look at this same uh, CT scan and you measure the relative uh, uh, distances of destruction here versus a uh, whole bone, this only accounts for about 20% of the total amount. And so, um, so images here, which are generated mostly by cancellous bone and not by cortex, are invisible in one view and just visible in another view, okay? And the most logical way to explain that is to take that, that picture that I drew before and just show you these four instances, okay? In the first instances, here you have a lesion that does not add to the material density of the bone, but doesn't affect the cortex at all. Um, and therefore is invisible because the bone hasn't been destroyed and the fat's been replaced by soft tissue, but the soft tissue plus the cortex is invisible, okay? Uh, here you have a lesion that's affected half of the thickness of one cortex, but in this view, again, you don't see anything because 75% of the bone in that field is intact. Now, if you put that lesion in the cortex here, or if you rotated the the way you did the radiograph by having another view, then all of a sudden you see a defect here where you didn't see a defect at all. Uh, this is a benign type lesion, but it's invisible in one orientation. Now, if you add the first instance to uh, this instance and you destroy the whole cortex in this particular case, now you see a hole in the bone. And the reason you see a hole in the bone is because you've taken out more than half of the bone in that path. Okay, now how does the pathology of bone tumors account for their relationship with the surrounded imaging? Um, I have to take you back to papers written by Dr. Lodwig in the, in the mid 1960s, where he defined a, a few kinds of, uh, of uh, bone alteration by infiltrative lesions. Okay, so this would be an example of a permutative lesion. Um, you sort of see that there's some cloudiness here. The only other thing you see is that maybe the cortex is a little bit thick here. You don't see very much in this view at all. And yet when you do a bone scan, you see that the entire tibia, proximal half of the tibia lights up for the most part. The reason for that is you have a process that's growing so fast that while it's able to infiltrate all the potential spaces in between the bone, because they offer it no resistance, 
The bone doesn't, uh, the bone doesn't get resorbed because this lesion is growing very fast. There isn't any osteoclastic resorption. And this lesion is, is highly extensive without having created any problem at all on the radiograph, save uh, areas where you really have to be a very good observer to, to tell that. And while there isn't that much bone destruction, this is associated with, when it's associated with a tumor, the most malignant kind of tumors. Now, the, the second kind of uh, bone destruction is the, the so-called um, moth-eaten kind of bone uh, destruction. Uh, my friend Dempsey Springfield always points out to me that moth eaten is maybe the wrong term because moths don't eat. They don't have mouth parts. Their larvae eat. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, here you see uh, areas of the cortex that are scalloped and uh, resorbed. You see areas of the tumor uh, extending into the marrow spaces. Um, there are areas here of the marrow spaces that are permeated by tumor, which you don't see. Um, and uh, radiographically, if you looked at the cortex, there are areas of the cortex that are nicely intact, and yet there's tumor inside the haversion systems. There are areas where the haversion systems are, are partially taken out, and you see lots and lots of scalloping here, so you know there's osteoclastic activity. And you know that this lesion in these parts can grow faster than osteoclastic resorption, and here the osteoclastic resorption has sort of kept up with it, and so the defects that you see on the radiograph tend to be larger. So while there are areas of, of permeation, there are also these lenticular defects where there's destruction. And this again is associated with malignant processes, but they tend not to be as locally malignant as permeative lesions. Um, then uh, there's the geographic kind of destruction where where the tumor is, there is no bone and where the bone there is, there is no tumor. And here you see that the lesion is not only fractured, but it's telescoped and there's a, uh, there's periosteal new bone. Um, when you make a section of this, uh, what you see is that the, the little, uh, little bits of tumor extend only to the intertrabecular spaces of the, the trabeculae that are opposed to this. This, of course, is a giant cell tumor. Uh, this is a geographic kind of uh, um, uh, bone destruction. And uh, this is quite characteristic of, of lesions that cause local destruction, but only in the area where the lesion is, right? And of course, if you, if you go back to the uh, actual uh, specimen here, you can see that if you placed a curette in here and the curette couldn't get down into these spaces fairly further away from this, this is why giant cell tumor, which is what this is, uh, will tend to recur locally. Okay, even though the lesion is benign. Finally, a, a variant of uh, geographic destruction is marginated destruction, where the, uh, where the actual uh, rim of the lesion has a, 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 an area of new bone uh, put around it. So uh, areas where the, the bone is destroyed, uh, the bone has the ability to reconstruct itself around these areas to prevent fractures. Uh, and this results in, in areas like this, where you see this, uh, scalloped radio density. Okay, so periosteal reactions are what I'd like to dwell on a little bit more than um, pure destruction. And basically, in my mind, there are two kinds of periosteal reaction. I'm a lumper. There are complete periosteal reactions, which infer that there's slow growth of a lesion that causes the bone to have a periosteal reaction, and an incomplete one where, where it infers rapid growth. Now, of course, what I mean by periosteal reaction is bone produced by irritated or elevated periosteum, okay? Um, if there is no bone put down by the periosteum, there may be a periosteal reaction, but it's not likely that you're going to see it in a radiograph, okay? Here is the cortex, the outside of a cortex of bone with uh, osteoblasts on it. This whole thing is periosteum. Inner part of that periosteum is sometimes called the cambium layer by the, by the uh, orthopedic surgeons who like to think about the, the cortex as a tree where all the osteoblastic and, uh, and osteoprogenitor cells are. The uh, outside of this is the fibrous layer. Um, you don't see the uh, connection between the fibrous layer and the cortex, but it's there uh, and it's sharpie fibers and uh, Sharpie fibers play an important part in the generation of a periosteal reaction sometimes. Here's a periosteal new bone reaction, okay? All of this is woven bone. The actual cortex is underneath here. 
Uh, this is lined partially by osteoblasts. A lot of osteoblasts have incorporated themselves into this reaction, which is how I know this is woven bone if I don't polarize it. And here again is your, uh, is your cambium layer, and here's the fibrous layer, okay? Um, this might look something like this if you uh, had a radiograph. Uh, this patient actually has Langerhans cell histiocytosis. You have a fairly well circumscribed lesion with a beveled edge. Look at this periosteal new bone. So um, it's formed on the outside of this uh, cortex <clears throat> and in fact um, is fusiform. So it's thicker here in the middle where most of the cortex has been destroyed. It's thinner where the cortex is a little bit more buttressed. Um, and uh, here's a more extreme example of this. Uh, this is a, a very fusiform, a fairly symmetrical periosteal reaction, which is so radiodense that you can't see the nidus of this osteoid osteoma inside it. You really have to do a CT scan uh, or a bone scan to see where this is. Um, and if you actually do a histology of this, and we don't do very much histology on intact osteoid osteomas anymore, um, you will see that uh, this nidus is buried inside the uh, cortex, and then you have all this porous neocortex on the outside, which is as a result of the periosteal reaction, which has uh, laid down all of this bone here. Okay, so it's a complete periosteal reaction. Now, here's an example of an incomplete periosteal reaction. Of course, you recognize this as a Codman's angle or Codman triangle. Basically, this area corresponds to this area. And here you have bone produced by this uh, elevated periosteum. And here the periosteum is elevated, but it's elevated here by actual tumor. And the only kind of tumor you see here is bone matrix produced by this tumor. This is growing too fast and elevating the periosteum too rapidly for there to be any cogent periosteal reaction here at all. So instead, we have this uh, linear area that sort of stops here, and you have radiolucency under this. This is quite characteristic of uh, malignant processes. And in this particular case, the fact that this bone is radiodense and you have radiodensity that's diffuse extending into the soft tissue is a very good evidence that this is probably an osteosarcoma. And in fact, when you, uh, when you section this, here is the periosteal reaction. It's complete here, but it becomes incomplete here. And it's only down here that you start to see the tumor poking out, okay? Here's another example of an incomplete periosteal reaction. This is what you call onion skin because there are multiple layers of this that look like layers of an onion sliced. Uh, and these layers are complete here where the periosteum is, is poking out, but doesn't have very much uh, tumor uh, uh, within the layers. But then out, outside here, you see that these have become rather discontinuous. And in fact, the, the cortex is a little bit attenuated here. It's sort of uh, saucerized, and that tells you that there's probably a soft tissue mass extending outside the bone. And if you look at uh, sections from here on a radiograph, you'll see that on the inside, there's a lot of tumor. On the outside, there's some tumor. Uh, and the, there's progressive infiltration of the Herbergian systems and the Volkmann's canals all the way to the outside. And the bone gets ever more delicate and ever more discontinuous. Um, and so that tells you that there's something bad going on. Now, if you give a patient like this uh, sufficient uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you can kill all of that tumor inside here. You may not kill all of the tumor in three dimensions, but you kill enough of this that the periosteal new bone actually keeps up with the uh, bone destruction and eventually surpasses it. And areas that were discontinuous before are continuous now. And you see that this is starting to become a buttress continuous periosteal reaction. And the onion skin layers that uh, that were, are caused by all of these dilated haversion systems are starting to remodel. Okay, now um, I, I showed you this picture before. Uh, this is the uh, surface of the bone termed at 90 degrees, and here is the, uh, here is the uh, fibrous periosteum. Here's a, another area of this cut thinner, and you can see that the fibrous area is actually connected to the outside of the cortex by these collagen fibers, these ropey collagen fibers, which are the Sharpie fibers. The Sharpie fibers are um, fairly elastic and fairly loose when, uh, when an individual is young. Uh, 
and they become ever more tense and tight as the individual gets older. Um, if you actually uh, elevate the periosteum and stretch the Sharpie fibers um, in the usual sense that they become vertical, um, periosteal new bone can be uh, deposited by osteoblasts that come in from osteoprogenitor cells in the periosteum. And they form this new bone that looks sort of like a picket fence, right? You have vertical streamers and little horizontal struts like this. This is just polarized to show you that these are woven as opposed to the uh, uh, lamellar under cortex. And uh, this sort of picket fence or hair on end distribution is what you see when the, when the periosteum is elevated broadly the Sharpie fibers are not discontinuous and they're all stretched in one direction, okay? Um, this can be continuous. You see that uh, with hemangiomas. You see that with other sorts of benign kinds of things. Subperiosteal hematomas sometimes will do that. But in this osteosarcoma, um, this hair on end periosteal reaction tends to get discontiguous when you have more tumor growing outside here. You still see a couple of these uh, uh, hair on end things, uh, which again come from Sharpie fibers, but uh, they're more contiguous here. And you see little, little bits of cumulus clouds in the base of this, which results from the uh, uh, bone matrix, but most of this new bone is not from bone matrix from the tumor at all, okay? Now, uh, in the case of where the tumor is growing much more rapidly and stretching the Sharpie fibers in such a way that the fibers uh, here are more parallel to the cortex and here more perpendicular to the cortex, you sort of get something that looks like this, okay? So here you have Sharpie fibers going like this. You have sharper, Sharpie fibers more perpendicular. You have them more parallel in this way. And in fact, you have more um, uh, bone type matrix produced on the inside of this. And this results in the so-called sunburst kind of periosteal uh, kind of reaction. And again, this is sort of discontiguous here. Um, and so this accounts for most of the things that you see in the, uh, in the periosteal reaction on uh, radiography. Um, extracellular mass can be osseous, it can be cartilaginous. Um, this is fairly simple. I don't have to generally explain this to you except to show you that uh, on this plane radiograph, you have a very dense proximal tibia. You have, um, you have dense matrix coming out into the soft tissue here and here. So this infers that tumor has come through the haversion systems, lifted up the periosteum, and then deposited bone matrix outside here. I'm more interested in these particular areas because radiographically, these areas show you bone where there should be marrow, okay? So the only areas that ought to be bone here uh, are the cortex and the small bits of cancellous bone. Uh, these are separated by smaller and smaller trabeculae, which are, are interconnected and lace-like. Uh, bone doesn't grow like this normally, okay? Not even in a fracture does bone generally grow like this. In order to get bone matrix deposited in between spicules, this basically has to be uh, malignant tumors which then generate that bone matrix. Uh, to show you that a little more pretty and a little more understandable, so here are, this is from the same case, here are uh, three different bone spicules which look sort of yellow-green. All of this red stuff, you can see the woven pattern of this is the woven bone. This is a stain that enhances uh, collagen when you polarize it. And all of, all of this is type three collagen, which is immature collagen produced by the osteosarcoma that has in, infiltrated all these spaces. And you can understand why that would make everything sort of diffusely cloudy and radio dense. A cartilage matrix is a different story because Cartilage matrix is radiolucent because most of cartilage is water, at least 70% of cartilage, even in neoplastic cartilage is water. And the way we see cartilage is by some of the trappings it leaves behind. So cartilage uh, tends to undergo endochondral ossification and sometimes calcification first, if there's enough of it. Uh, you can see that this individual has a funny iliac crest on this side. Portions of this are coming out. Uh, there's actually an osteochondroma here, but in that osteochondroma, there's independently growing hyaline cartilage, which tends to become endochondrally ossified and also calcified as this grows larger. And of course, you will recognize this because of the pattern of the ossification. Uh, 
or the calcification. The early calcification is little, little stipples like this. The later calcification uh, is endochondral ossification, which uh, goes, grows in the center of these lobules and creates what looks like popcorn. And if there's endochondral ossification on the outside, um, that creates uh, little arcs and rings, depending on whether they're complete or incomplete. This is what this looks like uh, um, grossly. And this is the corresponding specimen x-ray. So you see the underlying um, uh, uh, pelvis. And you see this very large mass. Most of this is radiolucent. But you can see little stipples and little popcorns and little rings and arcs. Uh, and I'm going to show you histology from each of these areas. So this is, this is just the amorphous calcification of areas that have a uh, cartilage matrix that's more than about three centimeters, which you know nothing will diffuse in there. It'll die, and eventually it'll calcify. And that looks like this when you look at it uh, histologically. It's very nondescript. Uh, if you look at an area like this, which looks like popcorn, what this represents is uh, ingrowth of blood vessels into areas that are are uh, calcified. Uh, ossification has taken place. If you look here, you can actually see secondary spongiosa, that is mixed spicules of, of bone and cartilage. This cartilage is the residual cartilage of the chondrosarcoma, so that part is malignant, but this part of the, the bone is benign, okay? And then if you look at an area like this, uh, this represents an area of, of lobular cartilage with the ossification around the outside, and, and here it is, okay? This is this is nothing more than sort of a three-dimensional construct of what a hen's egg would look like if you uh, gave it the right amount of uh, uh, radiation. Uh, and you would, you would see the outside as, uh, as uh, radiodense, but the inside would be relatively invisible. Okay. Now, I always thought about chondrosarcomas as, as, as being represented as like large bags of marbles. Okay. So chondrosarcoma in three dimensions looks like this, right? And if you were to play Lucy Frank Squire with something like that and do a, a specimen radiograph of that, you know, it, it sort of looks like what a chondrosarcoma would look like if everything in the cartilage were densely ossified. And of course, that's because. Um, uh, marbles are made of silicon dioxide, and silicon dioxide is radiodense. Now, if you took a bag of grapes instead, uh, and the mistake I made here was not getting grapes of different sizes, but I, I just didn't want to waste that many grapes. And then you do a specimen x-ray of that, you can actually see this as water containing lobules. Obviously, the water is not uh, invisible because it's surrounded by air and and you, you can demarcate these grapes by the contrast between the air density and the water density, just like you see uh, vascular markings and uh, inside lungs on a chest X-ray. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you, if you took a little bit of contrast media, put it in the same plastic bag, you could then see how the outside of these cartilage lobules would get radiodense, okay? And in fact, if you... Uh, if you injected them with the same stuff with a tuberculin syringe, you could actually make little stipples and bits of popcorn. The only problem is that to create something that looks like a chondrosarcoma, you need not only the uh, grapes of different sizes, but you need not to use liquid contrast medium because after all, calcifications are not liquid and you don't get contrast rings. So the next time I try this, I'm gonna roll the grapes in barium powder instead. There probably won't be a next time, but anyway. So finally, I just want to touch on complementary imaging. Um, CT scanning to me is great, but the problem with CT scanning is that although it is very sensitive, um, it's only sensitive where you can actually see the lesion. What you get in CT scanning is the same thing as one of my specimen x-rays over whatever slice of tissue you decided to make the thickness of the tissue and make, it, make a specimen x-ray of that. Uh, and the good thing about that is you don't actually have to slice the patient up to do that, okay? So here in an osteoid osteoma, we see where the osteoid osteoma should be. We see the, we see the nidus a lot better in that uh, radionuclide scan. Uh, here you see it best because the, the one millimeter slices uh, of this CT scan actually show you this lesion in three of the slices. Here you're already uh, above and here you're below. If you made these in three, in, in, in three or, or five millimeter slices or in one centimeter slices, there'd be a significant chance that you wouldn't see this at all. 
because we actually measure this, the nidus is only three millimeters. And therefore, you know, you need, uh, you need that uh, 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 scout film to show you where you want to look and you have to make your slices thin enough. Um, now, magnetic resonance imaging, um, you're gonna have to forgive me for this, okay? But magnetic resonance imaging, the way the, the, way the uh, orthopedic oncologist sees it uh, and the way the pathologist sees it in turn is measuring free hydrogen nuclei within a volume of tissue. Of course, that's not exactly true. Um, you can do magnetic resonance imaging, obviously, on, on any kind of uh, element that has an odd number of protons because I, what you're looking at, of course, is the resonance in the one excess nucleus that's around because the dipole moments point up and down and the, uh, and the waveforms that come out when you, uh, when you actually uh, stimulate the tissue cancel each other out uh, in anything with an even number. Um, and of course, the, uh, the uh, Larmor frequency that causes the resonance also is gonna vary by element. With some elements, uh, you would probably have to give microwaves or something uh, uh, even with even more energy to, to, to get a, a Larmor frequency. And so really the best things you see are, are, are hydrogen uh, atoms. And, uh, and um, this term water gram is, is not mine, it's Dempsey Springfield's term. Um, and I like it a lot because um, it shows you a lot about the, the, the distribution of, of water when you're looking at, uh, at hydrogen atoms. Um, this is extremely, extremely sensitive, in, at least by, by uh, my view. Uh, and it's very useful for certain things and it's not so useful in other things where you need to see, um, where you need to see contrast, it's very good. Where you need to see resolution, it's not so good. Where you have contrast, so for instance, in this osteosarcoma, you don't know where it ends here, but with the MR, you, you see a very exquisite edge, okay? And, and when I superimpose the specimen on the specimen on the, on the uh, actual MR, you see that this area where the MR tells you that this lesion ends, it actually ends, right? So that's very good. The, the problem I have with MR is, is that we can't yet correlate everything we see uh, on MRs with bone pathology. The problem is, is that MR is not just uh, an anatomic thing. It's sometimes a physiologic thing. Sometimes it's a subatomic phenomenon that not, is not even necessarily pathophysiologic or, or physiologic. For instance, here, where, where you see small osteophytes and maybe a little bit of joint narrowing here on this radiograph, okay? The, um, the uh, radiologist here, you know, looked at the distribution of this water in the cartilage and said, wait a minute, um, there are areas where the cartilage is just about completely eroded. There's, there's bone on bone here. Well, the, the problem when you say that um, uh, on, on your MR report, and then you get a, a specimen that shows you that there can't be bone on bone if bone doesn't extend to the surface of the uh, femur here, might extend to the acetabulum. I don't know that, but the problem is when they, uh, when they do a total joint with a hip, they use a reamer on the uh, acetabular side and everything is ground up in such a way that you can't tell that, that, uh, that uh, uh, there is complete erosion uh, uh, anywhere. You do see very small osteophytes near the fovea. Uh, you do see small osteophytes here and here. Um, I guess one could, could question whether or not this should have been done. I imagine this person had some stiffness and maybe a lot of pain, but the radiologist that wrote this report um, said that there was bone on bone. Uh, and that doesn't happen very often, but I can tell you it's happened at least 120 times in the last six or seven years that I've been looking at, at these things. And so I know that the sensitivity of, uh, of MR can sometimes, or maybe the radiologist can sometimes be a little much. And there's a lot we have to do to make uh, better correlations here. Okay, so um, I've basically reached the end of my time, more than the end of my time, because there has to be room for questions. Just wanted to show you this case. This is a 63-year-old a, a man who had pain in his right hip six months after having a diagnosis of non-small cell carcinoma of the lung. Everybody knew this was a metastasis, but in order to palliate this, it had to be proven. 
the uh, orthopedic surgeon curated this and got only what you see in the in the tissue here, which is is mature bone marrow and fat. Um, this shows no lesion at all. Whereas I know that if I see this in one view, 40% of the bone has to be gone in that view. And so after a lot of uh, complaining by the radiologist, uh, he assented to having a, uh, an interventional radiologist do a CT scan and uh, biopsy this with a small needle. And there you have metastatic carcinoma. So it's very important to know what you're looking at and know something about the geography of the tissue in order to be able to make a cogent diagnosis. And in the first instance, all I could tell the uh, surgeon was, I don't think you got any tissue. And in the second instance, it was very easy, okay? Um, this picture was given to me by Adam Greenspan from uh, UC Davis, who used to be my colleague at, uh, at Joint Diseases. Uh, it's, it's the nicest compliment I've ever seen paid to a pathologist by a non-pathologist, but it's not true. Uh, and after what I've just told you, you'll realize that what the pathologist actually sees is this, okay? The pathologist doesn't see any of this or any of this. The pathologist can only see this. And it's only when you have the whole rest of the picture that you tend to make the diagnosis that doesn't have you being run over by a train, right? This guy has a lot of tools, but he has the wrong tools for the particular task at hand. Um, and so, uh, with that, um, I am done. And uh, if anybody isn't back to work or has time for questions, uh, uh, ask away. And uh, these, by the way, are some of my uh, watercolors. Hey, Mike, uh, this is Don Resnick. Can you hear me? Yes, Don, how are you? Good, good. It's really good. Thanks for this terrific uh, lecture. You know, I, I have one comment and it, it kind of interested me. Uh, you showed the case of the uh, lead lines. Uh-huh. And it made me think of what Joe Whalen wrote years ago in the 1970s when he was at Cornell. If you remember, he said, when you look at those lines or growth recovery lines, they are a miniature of the growth plate. They have the same shape as opposed to something where part of the bone at the outside of the wings has been taken off. And he used that for the concept of osteocytic osteolysis of bone. And I know that concept now is still popular. It is debated. So any comments you want to make about the role of the osteocyte in terms of bone resorption? Uh, yes. Um, I am uh, virtually 100% that osteocytic osteolysis exists, but I'm not sure it exists enough to cause changes that are that uh, visible in the uh, bone. Uh, I, I think those probably still require osteoclasts. And the reason I say that is be, because of, the, uh, of, of what is, is in those lead lines and the way they get resorbed. But more importantly, um, so the role of osteocytes in, in terms of what happens in bone. Uh, of course, people tend to, uh, to think about uh, bone, particularly compact bone, as sort of a, uh, a calcific prison in, in which the osteocytes are sort of uh, entrapped for the rest of their lives. And, and uh, you know, people talk about uh, apoptotic osteocytes and uh, to, to all intents and purposes, osteocyte apoptosis doesn't happen. When you, when you see missing uh, osteocytes, either the uh, tissue has been over decalcified or the, or the osteocytes are dead. And if the osteocytes are dead, that means that two blood supplies had to be interrupted for that to happen. Unless you're looking at interstitial lamellae in, in which there are dead osteocytes, but that's normal. And, and that's also off my subject. Um, if, you, if you actually calculate the, the, total, um, the total surface area of all the osteocyte uh, um, lacunae plus all the uh, osteocyte uh, canalicular surface area, the, the area works out to be something between 200 and uh, uh, 300 meters squared, okay? Which I, I've seen in some papers, they've, they've said that it comes out to an acre. I, don't, I think that's a mathematical uh, uh, miscalculation, but, but that's a tremendous surface area. And that, that compares to uh, uh, things like the, uh, the uh, alveolar surface area in the lungs or the or the glomerular surface area 
by, by an order of magnitude of, of two or 300 times. So there's a tremendous amount of surface area there. And engineers will tell you where there's a tremendous amount of surface area, there has to be a tremendous amount of exchange because that's why things evolve that way. And particularly if the ratio of the surface area to the volume is very large, okay? And, and if you look at the ratio of the, of, the, of the surface area to volume in the kidney versus the, the, the surface area to volume ratio in the, uh, of the osteocyte canalicular system, it's of the order of 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth higher in the, in the uh, osteocyte canalicular system. So those have to be built for exchange, okay? And if there were significant uh, resorption of bone matrix by the osteocytes, with that much exchange area, there's no way you wouldn't see it on a radiograph. I can't believe you would. On the other hand, if there was a tiny amount of resorption, maybe just resorption of the mineral part and not necessarily the, uh, the collagenous part, that could be uh, back and forth reversible and it wouldn't be enough for you to be able to see because there really isn't that much, uh, there isn't that much volume to, to all of that. It's all surface area. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I believe there's a, a lot of osteocytic osteolysis just because of the engineering concept of uh, surface area and volume. But yet I don't believe there's enough actual resorption of the bone to be able to see. Well, yeah, that, that answered it. Thanks for the detail. I have one other quick comment. I know it's been, been kind of getting late here, but you mentioned 40% when we were talking about how much bone had to be gone for us to see it radiographically. One of our visiting scholars uh, years ago attacked that particular question with regard to the spine. And what he did was he put a drill in through the back of the vertebral body and started to remove bone without touching either the cortex or the subchondral bone plate. And then we went ahead and radiographed. And what was interesting was you could remove all of the interior of a vertebral body as long as you didn't touch the surface of the vertebral body and that lesion would not be detected radiographically. So I think it varies depending upon how much osteopenia there is yeah. and skeletal site. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, there's a, I have a whole diatribe on, you know, why is it that, that uh, uh, bone around the joints looks more trabeculated when you have osteoporosis and, you know, with uh, specimen radiographs and so on, even put that in the fascicle. And uh, yeah, that stuff is, is just absolutely fascinating. Well, Dr. Klein, thank you so much. That was uh, really fabulous. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Bye, everybody.